train Lord, I said the train is coming baby I said the train is coming now I said the train is coming baby I said the train is coming now Every day I pray Bonjour, ici Alan Rock, recteur de l'Université d'Ottawa, l'Université canadienne. Hello, this is Alan Rock, president of the University of Ottawa, Canada's university. Composez le numéro du poste que vous voulez joindre maintenant ou demeurez en ligne. Enter the extension number if you wish to reach now or stay on the line. Hey, here we are. It's the 5 o'clock train. I'm your host, Anir Ancourt, and the theme of the show this week is global warming. But before we start that theme, I just want to make a quick service, uh, community service announcement, N- and it's related to the theme of global warming. This is a special dinner and Latin music party in Ottawa that's going to occur on Sunday, July 3rd. It's just coming up, 7 p.m., Church of the Ascension. That's 253 Echo Drive, near Pretoria Bridge, 7 p.m. Sunday, some incredible Latin dance music, and it's put on by Pastors for Peace, and it's the friendship caravan to Cuba. That it, it, it's a, it's, there's an admission of $10, and it's to get money for that uh, caravan. Now, Cuba, and this is how it relates to our theme of today, the World Life Life. Wildlife Fund says that Cuba is the only sustainable country on the planet. So you know that Cuba survived the um, oil cusp. It was cut off because of the uh, economic embargo by the United States, and it had to transform its society from one that was a modern oil-based society to one that was cut off from these uh, from that resource. And it uh, its public health has increased. People walk and took the bicycle more. The agriculture was transformed and so on. Cuba is a remarkable place. Um, it's a place where uh, Cuban citizens receive free health care and uh, f- uh, free education, obviously, graduate school. It trains doctors from all around the world. And so don't miss this dinner and Latin music um, party, I guess, put on by the Pastors for Peace. 7 p.m. Sunday, July 3rd, Church of the Ascension, 253 Echo Drive. That's our announcement for this week. And we're on the phone today. As I said, global warming's a theme. And we have a world expert on this question on the phone. His name is Professor Dr. Ray Pierre Humbert. He's at the University of Chicago. And if our technical connection is working, he's on the line right now. Yes, hi, I'm right here. Great. It, I'm, we're really happy to have you on the show this week, uh, Dr. Pierre Humbert. And I'll just call you Ray for the rest of the show, if you don't That's mind. Great. That's just fine. Yeah. Um, I'd like to sort of start by introducing you. I mean, you are at the University of Chicago, and you have a special professorship there, and you are the Louis Bloch Professor in the Geophysical Sciences at the University of Chicago. That's right. And you've been there for since when? I mean, oh, you got your, your about PhD... About 20 years now. About 20 years, uh-huh. And so, and one... I mean, as a physicist myself, I know that in terms of establishment science, you're right up there because you have recently written a review article in Physics Today, which is the flagship magazine of the largest professional physics association in the world, uh, the American Physical Society. So it's quite an honor to have a, a review, a feature article in that uh, glossy magazine. I mean, it's, it's considered, I mean, you've reached the top when you're doing that, right? Well, I, uh, um, uh, generally speaking, I'm, I was happy to have that in physics today because I have always considered myself a physicist, although there's a geo in the front. And uh, I've always considered our field to be a part of physics that is done the way physics is done. Yeah. And what you're more specifically an expert in in relation to global warming is the actual physical mechanisms of radiation balance and global warming on the planet, right? Well, actually, uh, you know, I, uh, in a way, uh, I started off as an amateur in that particular subject because my training was in fluid mechanics, and maybe for the first 10 years of my career, uh, I was uh, doing straight fluid mechanics. But as I expanded into other planetary problems, paleoclimate and so forth, it was uh, 
clear I needed to learn about radiative transfer and water vapor and uh, things of that sort. So, well, uh, fluid yeah. fluid dynamics is related to the atmosphere. The, the atmosphere is a fluid, so there, it's not completely worlds apart, is it? Oh, no, not at all. It's just that uh, you can do quite a lot about how the winds move and how the currents in the atmosphere and ocean move uh, heat around without actually going into radiative transfer. Right. But uh, you can do much more when you uh, couple the two of them. Yes. Uh, much more that is relevant to planets and, and, their, and their climate. That's the idea, right? That's right. Actually, uh, the, uh, uh, there's a connection here that's between these two fields that uh, uh, puts in mind some of the issues you were raising in your uh, recent essay um, on uh, radiative balance and uh, climate change and global warming. Uh, namely, you emphasized the uh, em- the uh, simple physics questions, which yeah. we can uh, which we can do through uh, uh, through uh, radiative convective models, the sort of things you can do on a blackboard. But uh, where general circulation models become necessary, the complicated models, which have come in since the 1970s and 60s, uh, is when you want to couple that simple physics into the uh, fluid dynamics. Yes, in order to get more than just um, average radiative properties of the, cl- of the planet as a whole, but you actually want to say something about regional climates and, and changes in regional climate and so on, that's, that's, then you have to go to these more complicated models. Is that right? That, that's right, and uh, especially since a lot of impacts of climate uh, are through precipitation, uh, there's not a prayer of saying anything sensible about precipitation without fluid dynamics. But even for the average radiation balance, the two reasons it's necessary to have a full general circulation model, even though the initial work by Manabi was in the simple models, the reason it's necessary to have a full model is that uh, the... Uh, water oh, oh, one second, Ray. Um, there's a lot of static on the line. Is there a reason for that? Um, uh, there, I, I, think, uh, I think a... Let's see. Uh, there may be a loose wire here on this. Okay, are we better now? A little better, yeah, that's better now. Okay. Okay. You're in your office. That's right, yes. In Chicago. That's right. And we won't talk about what the weather's like. Oh, it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot, yes. But, uh, okay, so um, uh, you, you need the fluid dynamics to get uh, the uh, water vapor feedback because the uh, water vapor content of the atmosphere is not something that's assumed in models. It's something that's uh, calculated on the basis of the fluid dynamics. Yes. Yes, sure. Um, now, without getting into those details, because these, these models, even just talking about them, is complicated enough, um, I just want to get a sense. Well, well first, I want to tell our listeners that we're going to be going at this with you today for the full hour, and then next week we're going to have another uh, renowned scientist, who is Richard Lindzen from MIT, who is also a science expert in this field, but who tends to be more critical, uh, who, in, in the sense that he's critical of the, of the warmest view, whereas you um, are of the, I would say, the establishment view that global warming is something that we need to be concerned about and that it's a significant world problem. Right. Yeah, right. I, well, I, I don't know I, that I agree with the notion that there is a warmest view uh, uh, unless you're willing to say that there's, say, a uh, gravitationalist view among people that uh, think that Newton's law of gravitation is a uh, pretty accurate and uh, generally useful theory. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> well, what I, what I mean is that the view, let, let's just, maybe it's more of a political position, but the view that it's something that we need to be concerned about, that the physical warming of the planet uh, in terms of how the radiation balance is being affected and how that affects the climate is something that we need to be concerned about as, as citizens of countries. Okay, I would go along with that description. Okay, so if we define warmest that way, that the scientists who also have that position as warmest, then we're, we should agree on that, on that definition. Well, I, do, I don't like putting the label warmest on it because that, that uh, makes it sound like a, a um, political... Okay. Uh, movement or something yes. rather than an evidence-based thing. You know, if, if uh, Dick Lindzen were to come through something, come up with something actually publishable and correct, 
that uh, said climate sensitivity was provably low, well, I would change my attitude. But, okay. Uh, well, he's not here to defend himself right now, but I will communicate that, uh, that criticism to him uh, next week. Um, but what would you like me to call the, the, the scientists who are of the opinion that this is a significant problem that citizens need to be concerned about? I, I think physicist is good enough. <laughs> You're, well, I'm a physicist, and I'm not of that view, so I, that's not going to work. <laughs> well, okay, well, let's get beyond the terminology then, because All right. the view is grounded in physics, and there are physicists who understand the physics, and there are physicists who don't understand the physics. Vlam! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, let, let me put it this way. Since we agree that we're talking about um, the idea that citizens need to be concerned about this, and I think we can agree on the fundamental physics that the radiation balance is affected by CO2 in such a way as to increase the average global temperature of the Earth. Yes. We can agree on that. Okay. And, I'm, and, and, and I agree on that, too. Um, then there's the question of the amount, and we could probably, you know, roughly agree on that as well, the amount of warming, the amount of increase in the average temperature. But then there's the uh, more sensitive question or more difficult question, and I think it's really difficult to base this one in pure physics. Why does it matter if the global average temperature, if, you know, if the radiation balance were to change to the extent to change the global average temperature by, let's say, let's give a figure, one degree Celsius. Why does that matter on a planet, you know, we're here in Canada, winter to summer, day to night, we're all over the place in variations. You can barely detect this, these changes in the average. You ha people are arguing about it in scientific papers all over the place. What is the basis for believing that that is going to significantly affect our ecology, our human lives, and so on? Well, first of all, we're not talking about just one degree. Uh, the uh, middle range of climate sensitivity predictions is more like a three and a half degree warming uh, for a doubling of carbon dioxide. And uh, we could go to much warmer than that uh, with the likely available coal reserves, even with that middle range uh, climate sensitivity, because we could go beyond doubling of CO2. And so on top of it, even for that middle range of estimated warming of say three and a half degrees, Celsius, uh, that masks the fact that it warms about 50% more over land than it does over the global mean, and it warms more in the Arctic and probably also in the Antarctic than it does in the, pol in the global mean. And um, another indication of the extreme kind of uh, impacts you could have is from a paper by David Battisti and by Naylor where they point out that even in the middle range of predictions, the uh, typical summer uh, around 2050 or 2060 uh, becomes as hot as the hottest summer on record in a vast part of the globe. And this has big consequences for agricultural productivity. Many crops uh, uh, can be severely impacted by even a few days of extreme heat. Okay. And you can add up a whole bunch of things of this sort. Right. Uh, but I, I just want to be clear that the things you just mentioned are all... You know, I mean, we, we haven't doubled the amount of CO2 that we presently have yet. So this is all very hypothetical. And all of the... Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, I have to interrupt. It's not hypothetical. We haven't doubled CO2 yet. But uh, at the present rate of burning fossil fuels, there's absolutely no question that we will double CO2 sometime in the next uh, 50 years. All right. But what I'm w in addition, the other component of that hypothesis is that if you agree that we're going there, that we're going to double CO2, there's not much we can do about that. Oh, if no, no, we can do about it. We can decide not to burn so many fossil fuels. We can decide to use our energy more efficiently, more renewables, more nuclear. So w that's, that's in our hands. Okay. So uh, let's say we were to double uh, the amount of CO2. These um, predictions about the, the different amounts of warming on different parts of the planet are all based on models. We, obviously, we haven't done those experiments yet. 
Well, uh, they are based on models, but models doesn't necessarily mean uh, just general circulation models. Uh, a lot of them, uh, a lot, uh, as you even said in your own essay, can be drawn from quite simple models if they're done correctly. Yes. Yes, but it's still model predictions. I mean, we're well, talking about the future. We're talking about it, it's it's risk. We're we're projecting risk into the future. That's uh, let's just agree that that's what we're doing. That's really true. And in fact, the the uh, proper role for deliberative democracy here, uh, and the proper disagreement between different political camps, uh, should be not on the basic science, but uh, which is pretty well consolidated in the big picture. But the, uh, the disagreement should be over how to respond to an uncertain risk. It's a risk management thing. Because it is possible that uh, the climate sensitivity is lower than we think. Uh, that would be hard to reconcile with most past climate, but it's possible. But it's also possible that the climate sensitivity is a lot higher than we think. And if we're wrong on that side, then the consequences are really severe. Yes. And, you know, what I find difficult in this whole debate is you just expressed that it was possible that the climate sensitivity is uh, lower than what the mean, you know, of, of the s scientists are estimating, or it could be higher. You just said that, right? That's right. That's absolutely and, true. And now, when you say that, what, what, what I find of concern is that there's no way really to test, to empirically evaluate or to have some sense of whether it's higher or lower. In, in, in other words, there, there, is, there is a debate and there is argument, a, a, quite a significant argument on things like water vapor feedback, on whether or not it's been overestimated, on uh, you know, all of these things. So it, it's really disheartening when we're making predictions based on sort of a mean, a kind of consensus. Uh, you know, if, if I were uh, going to be confrontation, I would say groupthink. And uh, then, but but we don't have a way of, of of really getting at. Well, are we being over overly pessimistic? Are we being reasonable? There's no real outside test. Well, that's not that's not actually true uh, because, first of all, there are ways of testing the uh, various physical components in models. Although we only have one Earth to experiment with, we're doing that experiment right now. Uh, we we uh, we can actually do kind of natural experiments and laboratory experiments that test things like our understanding of the radiative effect of water vapor. We can look at the response of water vapor to volcanic eruptions, the cooling that comes from that. Uh, oh, okay, well, hold it. Let's just past climates, things like that. So there are quite a lot of yes. Tests of course, I agree with you. There's yeah. lots of things that science does in the laboratory. For example, the first item that you mentioned is we can measure the cross-section for infrared absorption of water vapor in the laboratory, right? That's right. Exactly. No one would, you know, no scientist would say that that's not true. Of course you can. But that's a very fundamental property of the water vapor molecule. Um, uh, th this is just a basic building block of our knowledge of molecules and so on. But there is a heck of a, a large construction between that kind of basic building block and then putting it all into a, a model of the planet and then saying that all the ingredients in that model are okay. Well, I mean, but uh, we do have ways of testing certain aspects of the collective behavior, uh -huh. in particular water vapor feedback, which I would argue is quite well established by now. Uh, we have you know, learn is primarily governed by the large-scale fluid dynamics of the atmosphere. Uh, and these are the things that we can verify the fluid mechanical models, the GCMs, are actually doing pretty well, at least in the statistical sense that counts. Uh, and um, I've argued, and many others have argued, I think, pretty convincingly, that uh, the basic physics models are using to uh, predict the water vapor concentration in the atmosphere is sound. We can't say the same thing about clouds at all, and that's why clouds are really the main source of uncertainty in how warm it's actually going to get. Well, you've ar I, uh, we're going to take our first music break soon, but you've argued convincingly. Y you're of the opinion that you've argued convincingly. My point is it hasn't been demonstrated. Um, well, what you mean by demonstration, I mean, there's always some uncertainty, and the political system makes uh, decisions in the face of uncertainty all the time. Well, okay. 
Um, I'm gonna we're at, we're gonna take our first music break. When we come back from this first music break, and first we're going to introduce the music, of course, and the, that's that's sort of a a nice treat for our listeners as well. But when we come back, I'd like to concentrate on the idea that um, or the the understanding and try to, uh, to u- use you as an expert about how water vapor in the atmosphere is determined by the fluid dynamics. Sure. Is that, would that be good for a topic that's, that's a- great. after the first yep. music break? Now, I want to tell our listeners, uh, you've, b- you've suggested music for the show, and I'm really happy you did. Um, there, you, there's one piece that we've got to play, and that's by Pete Seeger, which is right on theme here, right? It's a really nice piece about, the, about this uh, topic. But you um, are a music writer and player. You play the accordion, and you've sent me some of your own pieces, which are just lovely. Haven't oh, you? I didn't write those pieces. Oh, you emphasize. didn't. Yeah, I just played them. Okay, that was a misunderstanding. Yeah. But they're 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 beautiful pieces, and I've got them here. Uh, you playing them? I've got uh, high quality recordings, so we're going to play those as well. But should we play the Pete Seeger one first? Oh, let's do that by all means. Okay. Quite early morning. All right. Well, could you tell us about it? Well, so quite early morning is uh, a Pete Seeger song that I think was written uh, probably in. Uh, response to the threat of nuclear holocaust, but maybe also environmental holocaust. Uh, but uh, his point was, uh, was an undying uh, faith that people can endure and find ways to solve their problems, and that one shouldn't ever despair and give up hope, because we do have time to solve these problems. We can't put them off, but we can solve them. So that's uh, what Pete Seeger is telling us in his beautiful song. We'll be right back after this song, so stay with us. Okay, what's going on here? Just a second. These early warnings The time is now Quite early morning If we could heed These early warnings The time is now Quite early morning Some say that humankind won't long endure What makes them feel so doggone sure I know that you who hear my singing Would make those freedom bells go ringing I know that you who hear my singing Make those free bells go ringing And so we keep on while we live Until we have no, no more to give And when these fingers can strum no longer And the old banjo Young ones stronger And when these fingers Can strum no longer And the old banjo The young ones stronger So though it's darkest Before the dawn This thought keeps me Moving on all this world of joy and of sorrow, we still can have singing tomorrows through all this world of joy and of sorrow. We still can have singing tomorrow. Thank you. 
The TD Ottawa International Jazz Festival kicks off Thursday, June 23rd until Sunday, July 3rd. This year, the OLG Late Night Stage in Confederation Park will be your favorite place to end your evening. The shows start at 10.30 p.m., and you can catch Elliot Brood, Solville, Leaf Fields and the Expressions, among others, at this cafe-inspired tent. Access to all the shows at the OLG Late Night Stage is included with your 10-day pass, which starts at $158 for adults or $73 for students. For more information, visit ottawajazzfestival.com. Bridgehead is celebrating a decade of serving great coffee and tea to the Ottawa community. Bridgehead supports small-scale farmers by offering 100% fairly traded and organic coffees and teas. Their commitment to social responsibility means grower families receive more money for their coffee and cooperatives receive more money for special projects chosen by the community. Bridgehead wants to thank you for your support over the past decade and looks forward to serving you a tasty coffee, tea, and freshly baked good at one of their 12 Ottawa locations. Okay, we're back. This is the 5 o'clock train. I'm your host, Denis Roncourt. We're on every single Thursday of the year from 5 to 6 p.m. And this week, the theme is global warming, and we're with renowned physicist and expert Ray Pierre Humbert from the University of Chicago. Welcome back, Ray. Hello. Yep. Yep, welcome back. Um, So um, that was a beautiful song. Did you get to hear it? Oh, yes, yes. That sounded like uh, Pete's... um a uh, really recent recording uh, recording of it. Uh, he he did. Uh, let me get this wire back in place again. Uh, I, were we getting static again? Yeah, we were there. I think you fixed it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That was when it sounded like one of his recent uh, recent recordings of it. Uh, it was yeah, they they should fund you with a better phone there at the University of Chicago. Oh, I don't actually use the, this landline very much. Okay. Uh, I'm mostly digital on uh, yes. Skype. Okay, good. Um, um, listen, what? How does that work with estimating water vapor in the atmosphere? Right. So the so the the uh, the water vapor that counts for uh, water vapor feedback is not the water vapor very near the ground, it's the relatively small amount of water vapor that's higher up in the atmosphere, because that's, uh, because to make a greenhouse effect, uh, you have to uh, put a greenhouse gas like water vapor or CO2 up where the atmosphere is colder than the surface. And uh, the uh, humidity up there is actually governed by uh, the rate at which you take uh, air from a moist place moist warm place move it to a cold place where you wring out the moisture by just plain thermodynamics the clausius clapperin relation as it's called uh the same thing that makes um moisture condense uh, on a bottle of beer uh when you take it out of the refrigerator so you rain it out in a sense you rain it out okay. by moving the air to a colder place and then you move the air back to a warmer place and uh then uh you have subsaturated air air that has uh lower amounts of humidity than it could hold in saturation. Yes, can I just, as, as a good student, can I just stop you there for a second? The first thing you said um, was that water vapor nearer the surface is not so important, and I, I don't really understand that that well, because it seems to me that a lot or most of the infrared radiation is coming from the heated surface of the planet itself. And, no, well, so, uh, and so uh, it, would, it would be intercepted by this water vapor greenhouse gas anywhere above the surface. See, but uh, it's, it's the uh, greenhouse, it's the effect of the water vapor on the greenhouse effect yes. uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, and uh, if you put some water vapor near the surface, yes. uh, where the air has nearly the same temperature at the surface, then even though you are um, making the low-level air uh, radiate better, uh, you, uh, it's radiating at the same temperature as the surface. So, you, so in the end, you just replace radiation from one thing at a given temperature with something else a little above it. I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't so. quite understand that because it seems to me if the radiation uh, infrared from the surface is going up, then anywhere above it where it encounters uh, water vapor, that water vapor will uh, resonantly absorb it and then re-radiate it, as you say, depending on its temperature, both upwards and downwards. So it, there will be a, a greenhouse effect downwards. Uh, no, there, no, there's no greenhouse effect uh, if you put a greenhouse gas at something that has the same, at some place where you have the same, 
at some place that has the same temperature as the surface. And that's because of, of Kirchhoff's law, essentially. Uh, something that's a good uh, absorber is also a good uh, emitter of right. infrared radiation. Uh, and, uh, and so there's so no net effect because it's radiating just as much up as down. The gas is. That's what you're saying, basically. Well, it, it, the, the temperature of the the temperature of the air near the surface is yes. kept similar to the temperature of the surface itself by turbulent heat exchanges. Yes. Yes. And so basically, it doesn't matter whether you radiate from the ground directly or whether you radiate from the air just a little bit above the ground. Okay. Fine. But. Just a little bit above, that's, that's another place where I have a problem with this. Um, the temperature as you go up in altitude, as anyone who's ever climbed up a, a mountain knows, is constantly changing as you go up. It gets cooler and cooler. So oh, oh, mo no, mo mo most of the air is yeah. not at near surface temperature. Exactly, and that's that was my uh, uh, that was my point. And uh, when I say a little bit above, I mean you know like a few meters or or maybe a hundred meters above the surface. Uh, right. W whereas the water vapor that is a few kilometers above the surface does give you a greenhouse effect. Yeah, but the 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 point I'm trying to get across is. There's a lot of space between a few kilometer altitude and a few a hundred meter altitude. There's a lot of atmosphere there between those two extremes. Oh you're, yeah. you're, you're saying so we have no disagreement about that. I'm just uh, making the point that in order to understand the water vapor feedback, it's not the water vapor very near the surface you need to understand. It's the water vapor uh, significantly above the surface. See, that's the problem that I have, and I know this argument. The, the argument is that it's the water vapor at the highest altitude that matters most. But no, uh, not just at the highest. Uh, well, that, at, that's at, a misconception. The it's, it's the water vapor uh, in the mid to upper troposphere. Okay, mid it's to it's upper. In, yeah. But what about mid to lower? There's a lot of water vapor there. In fact, most of it's there. Um, well, like anything, like anything else, uh, you know, there's no, there's no magical switch. We know we're, you know, below this altitude, it's not significant at all, and above this altitude, it is significant. Uh, it's a continuous thing. Yes. And in fact, uh, this can be quantified using a sensitivity uh, analysis. But, but Ray, Ray, there's yeah. a problem here. Um, the argument about physicists having understood water vapor in the papers that claim that, and you have cited those papers relate to the upper atmosphere. No, not just the upper atmosphere. Well, we, uh, the, uh, the mid, mid to upper. Okay, I'll give you mid to upper. No, from the ground all the way up to the, uh, all the way up to, say, the tropopause, the uh, place where the stratosphere starts. I mean, the well, if it's from the ground, then we're back to saying at first you were saying something near the ground doesn't matter. Right, but uh, so uh, the uh, stuff near the ground doesn't actually matter, but uh, I'm just saying that the particular arguments that do give you the water vapor in the places where things, where things do matter uh, apply equally well near the ground uh, uh, as they do um, significantly above the ground. Because I don't think really that's true. It's really simply a matter of the, uh, the extent to which the large-scale air currents move air uh, from warm, moist places to colder places and then move it back. And that's something that uh, we have a lot of evidence the GCMs are doing correctly. Okay. We well, also have uh, another line of evidence that there's no stabilizing water vapor uh, feedback or no strongly stabilizing water vapor or cloud feedback because it would be extremely hard to account for how cold it got during the last ice age in the southern hemisphere if there were some unknown strongly stabilizing feedback in the climate system. Well, isn't that a counter-argument to the idea that you need water vapor positive feedback? No, because if you didn't have a positive feedback, uh, you would not get a, uh, an ice age that was as cold as the actual ice age in the southern hemisphere. Okay, now you're going to have to explain that one. <laughs> How okay. does that go? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, basically, uh, you know, many things in, in, the pa in past climates give us uh, a check on climate sensitivity. Yes. On, uh, in in other words, there are typically a lot of negative feedbacks, in other words, that don't allow the system to just run away. Well, in fact, the most important uh, negative feedback, the thing that keeps the, the planet from running away to infinite temperature, is what's called the Planck feedback, the mere fact that when a body gets warmer, it radiates more to space. Sure. 
And then these other feedbacks, these uh, destabilizing feedbacks like water vapor feedback and cloud feedback as it occurs in most models, uh, uh, reduce the stabilizing feedback and therefore make climate more sensitive uh, without being so extreme that they cause our climate to run away. And yeah. one way we estimate these, um, this climate sensitivity is by looking at how the climate responded to past changes in carbon dioxide. Now, wait, wait a minute. You just said something. You said yeah. that the cloud feedback reduces the negative feedback of the radiation loss. That is a description of the cloud feedback as it exists in most general circulation models. Right, but it's wrong. No, that's not. Come that's, on, that's not. You're, you're, you're that's saying one that. Of the uncertainties. Okay, that's come on now. Come on. Uh, okay, let's just let let me make this point. The cloud feedback you're saying you just said reduces the negative feedback of the greater radiation loss. That's what you're saying. <laughs> how, 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 how would that work? I mean, clouds give you an increase in albedo. Oh, well, you seem not to understand clouds. Clouds uh, are kilogram for kilogram a much more powerful, uh, a, a much more powerful uh, greenhouse agent uh, than either water vapor or carbon dioxide. Okay. And so high clouds actually uh, give you a greenhouse effect. And so depending on the balance between the reflection effect of high clouds and the greenhouse effect of high clouds, they can have a warming. What's more, clouds are created by uh, condensation of water, not by warm, moist air. Right. Uh, and in fact, you can have situations, and we know of situations that are observed, in which warming actually causes low clouds to dissipate, which decreases the reflectivity and gives you a destabilizing feedback. Uh, so you have, you're, you're saying that ge uh, field geophysicists have gone and seen that phenomenon and measured it? No, there are definite cases uh, in which uh, you can see that happening, but I will be right up front that uh, clouds can, can are the least well understood thing uh, in climate modeling, and that's the whole reason why uh, there is a spread of predictions of what the climate sensitivity actually is. It's quite possible uh, that there is some unknown cloud feedback that would make the climate sensitivity low. But what you have to set against that is that we also know many ways uh, in which the cl clouds could make the climate sensitivity even higher. Than but, the you know, IPCC. no many ways. I can pull as many ways as you want out of a hat either way. Well, you you can sit down on, at these your are desk. quantified, uh, quantified uh, cloud models based on sound radiation physics. Models, and you within said. Within what we know, well, they're physics. Uh, no, but, well, okay, wait, 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 wait. Right. No, 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 no. No, but uh, wait. I'm not going. I'm not I going to wait because it's essential okay. that you understand that uh, these are not things that are just pulled out of a hat. These are a range of possible futures that represent our best understanding of what could happen. And right now, within what we know about clouds, it is entirely possible it's, uh, that clouds could make the warming even worse than the mid-range, even the top range of the IPCC. And what's more, various studies of past climates tilt things toward saying that the climate is, if anything, more sensitive to doubling CO2 than the IPCC range rather than less. But those models, I mean, there, there are mo models. The, the, but they, 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 these same... Of observation. Okay, but these same models are also the ones that claim to be in agreement with the amount of warming that has been directly observed since the industrial era. So how... How can you say, on the one hand, that the models that we have, our best understanding, correctly models the warming we have directly observed, we claim, and at the same time say, but these same models, the sensitivity could be much higher? Yes, and so that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting and important point. The reason that there's this uncertainty about what the climate sensitivity is, despite the warming to date, is that so far uh, we've only gone a little bit of the way towards doubling CO2, and what's more, the ocean takes a long time to warm up, so we haven't even realized the entire warming that goes with the nearly 400 parts per million CO2 that we have right now. How long does and, it take the ocean to warm up? 
So, uh, oh, the ocean will continue to warm. Even if we stopped increasing CO2, the ocean would actually continue warming up for about a thousand years before it came into equilibrium. And well, so equilibrium is, is, it's never in equilibrium really because it's a dynamic system. But, well, but I mean, a thousand years, surely it would warm up to, uh, you know, 90% of its value way before a thousand years. It wouldn't be 90% because there's, uh, there is a, a part of the warming that comes in pretty quickly through the upper ocean, uh -huh. but in the deep ocean really takes a thousand years to come all the way into equilibrium. Yes, but in terms of the average surface temperature of the water, surely you don't have to wait a thousand years to get the effect. No, you see some of the effect, but you, you, there, you, you need to wait a thousand years be before you see the full effect. And the committed warming... But what, uh, what's the full effect compared the to the... effect that you see in the first 50 years. But what's the full effect on the surface temperature of the water compared to what you would see a hundred years into an increase of CO2? And as I said, that depends on uh, the rate of ocean heat uptake, which sure. is one of the uncertainties. And it, the reason I was bringing this up is that uh, is that uh, the, the reason you can get many models with different climate sensitivity all agreeing on the warming to date is that there are uncertainties in the things that have delayed the warming, such as the effect uh, of ocean heat uptake and also, uh, equally importantly, the effect of uh, various other kinds of pollution, sulfate aerosol, uh, hazes from dirty coal and so forth, that have a cooling effect. And so um, uh, within this window of the relatively mild warming we've seen so far, uh, there are many ways to, to match the data and still have different predictions for the future. And that's why the 20th century climate, unfortunately, does not uniquely pin down the climate sensitivity. Okay. I think it's a good time to have a break of music that you made. Okay. And the first one that I've lined up is called, uh, let me see, it's called When I'm Gone. Yeah, so this is um, an arrangement I made uh, which starts with um, uh, an instrumental version of uh, Pete Seeger's song and then segs into a Phil Oakes piece called uh, When I'm Gone. And what does it relate to? Who, who would be gone and why would they be gone? Oh, so actually the, the, uh, the words uh, go so, uh, to the Phil Oakes piece uh, go something like... Um, uh, I, I, I can't uh, fight the fight when I'm gone, so I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. Oh, nice. That, that's okay. the cement. But, but there are all the other things that you, you don't get when you're gone. I can't breathe the air when I'm gone. Uh, I can't fight the fight when I'm gone, so I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. Nice. Well, here we go. I'm sure our listeners are going to enjoy this. You're listening to The 5 O'Clock Train. I'm your host, Anir Ankur. And here is some beautiful accordion that was arranged and played by Dr. Ray Pierre Humbert.
The Left Tenants Pump at 361 Elgin Street has long been a favorite gathering place for many a fine folk in Ottawa. More than a well-stocked watering hole, the Left Tenants Pump is famous for its weekend brunch, Sunday roast beef dinner, and Wednesday wing night too. Groups can meet in the back room, two can dine in a cozy nook, singles feel comfortable chatting at the bar. In the best sense of the word, there's something for everyone. When you're thinking about where you'd like to go, try the Left Tenants Pump, 361 Elgin Street at Frank. Hey, we're back. This is the 5 o'clock train. We're back with our guest, Dr. Pierre Hum, uh, Dr. Ray Pierre Humbert. Welcome back, Ray. Hello. Yes, I'm happy to be here still. Um, um, it would be nice to learn about what your work is actually like, I mean, day to day. You're at the university there. You've got a laboratory, a research group. Could you tell us the atmosphere of your department or and or research group and so on and, and, and what the day-to-day work of a climate scientist is like, a physicist? Sure. Well, I'm a theoretician rather than an observer, an experimentalist. So uh, uh, what I say applies to my particular style or or end of climate science. But essentially, uh, most of our work uh, is done on the blackboard, on paper, and on computers. And we spend a lot of time uh, reading other people's papers, discussing them, pulling them apart. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, writing down equations on the blackboard to try to understand basic phenomena. Right now, for example, I'm working on a problem uh, on uh, uh, so what's called snowball earth, where the earth may have frozen over completely 600 million years ago, and a student of mine and I are trying to uh, understand how dust gets moved around. And so we have a whole bunch of glaciologists here. We've been getting together, uh, reading up on... Uh, papers on dust and papers on uh, ice shelf flow and uh, making simple models of it and programming them up and uh, talking about them. But uh, basically, it's a lot of equations, a lot of talking, um, a lot of uh, writing stuff on the blackboard, and uh, then from time to time, uh, travel to various meetings to share our results and find out what other people are doing. And when you're gathered around the blackboard, how many are of you are there? I mean, how many people are directly in your group and so on? Well, I have a pretty small group. There may be um, oh, uh, two grad students and one or two postdocs at any one time, but then we have maybe you know four or five other faculty members in this department who are uh, interested in various aspects of climate, and so they have their own students and so forth. And so we could have up to maybe 20 or 30 people sitting around a table for some things and maybe you know, two to four people for other things. And the other faculty members, are they also theorists? Well, so we have uh, some people who are are gathering data on glaciers, for example. Doug McHale uh, is spending a lot of his time now looking at melt ponds on Greenland to try to understand uh, how the uh, melt water affects the rate at which Greenland ice melts and where the water goes when it drains out through fractures in the ice. And then we also have um, uh, uh, another uh, faculty member, Liz Moyer, who is doing uh, laboratory work and field experiments, aircraft experiments, on uh, water vapor in the atmosphere, measuring it more accurately to try to understand how water vapor gets into the stratosphere. Uh, and so we have, a, we have a whole range of things. And then, since this is a very broad department, uh, uh, covering a wide range of geosciences. We also have people who are actually digging up ocean sediments and analyzing it for uh, indicators of past climate, things of that sort. Wow. But it sounds like you're the lone theorist, though, in terms of a faculty member. Oh, no. We all do, uh, we all do quite a lot of theory. Um, uh, but we've got, say, you know, three or two or three other um, faculty members who are doing theoretical things with regard to climate. Oh, what, what, what are they? Oh, so we have um, uh, Nobura Nakamura, who uh, is working on fluid mechanics of mixing, uh, particularly related to stratospheric chemistry and also the, the basic dynamics of the lower parts of the atmosphere as well, you know, where uh, storms and waves and eddies come from. Uh, and then we have um, uh, Dave Archer, who uh, does theoretical and computational chemical oceanography related to carbon uptake uh, in the ocean, and uh, Dorian Abbott, who's a new faculty member who uh, is working with uh, me and other people on 
climate of extrasolar planets, uh, and uh, that's primarily theoretical work. Right. So no one is actually, uh, in their research, doing global circulation models. Oh, uh, global circulation models are not an end in themselves. They're, no. They're a tool for yeah. testing hypotheses, and so... Um, uh, no, but there are researchers who um, implement the algorithms within those models and develop the models themselves and so on. So there's no one like that in your department. Oh, well, uh, w w uh, it, this is something that uh, you can do at a university, and I do it myself. Uh, in fact, we're developing a new climate model that is uh, designed to be flexible enough to handle the new planets that are being discovered around other stars. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we build on the base of what other climate modeling groups have done, but uh, we need to be able to uh, deal with smaller planets, bigger planets, planets that uh, always present the same face to their star, have weird uh, compositions in the atmosphere, things like that. And are they global circulation models? The oh, ones they are, that yes, you're, yes. Fully, uh, fluid dynamical global circulation models. Okay. But it's just one point on the continuum of models. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and um, have you, do you also have relatively simple radiation transfer models that don't include all of the fluid dynamics and so on that you work with in order to test um, you know, how processes are going to work out and this kind of thing? Oh, in fact, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, usually the first ta attack on a completely new problem uh, is, is with a uh, simple radiative transfer model. And so I had a paper with a collaborator that just came out in Astrophysical Journal Letters on the idea that you could make planets in very distant orbits habitable using the greenhouse effect of a massive hydrogen atmosphere. And that was a quite novel idea. And, and well, we it's were, habitable if you can breathe hydrogen. Uh, habitable in terms of um, <laughs> a temperature that uh, a temperature that supports right. liquid water, but there are right. kinds of life that do breathe hydrogen. Yes. You can uh, make methane at a, by combining hydrogen and CO two and release energy that way. There are methanogens that do that. Yes. So it's habitable not for yeah. us, but for some forms of life. But yeah, anyway, but they're not the kinds of forms of life that you would want to have a relationship with or anything. Well, if you uh, if I, are you an oxygenist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to keep an open mind about, <laughs> about life. So, but any, any, anyway, so you know, the first the first attack on that was through a simple radiation balance model, and, and then later we will uh, try to look at that in a full global circulation. Yes, and th model. that recent model, that recent paper, just was published, or is just going to be published? It's uh, it's available online uh, right now at uh, Astrophysical Journal Letters. Okay. So, well, we'll look forward to seeing yeah. that. Oh, and I should also mention that in terms of a toolkit for building these simple models, um, I just published uh, a book from Cambridge University Press, uh, and uh, uh, online I put um, every single um, building block for every model that I use to do calculations in that book. Uh -huh. So anybody who wants to actually um, actually reproduce any of those things calculations or go further can just go right to the website and even if you didn't buy the book you can um, yes. download the well tell us the tell model. us what the book is oh sure it's actually there are two books that just came out uh -huh. um, uh, the one I was just talking about is called principles of planetary climate and it really is about how to build these simple non-fluid mechanical models that give us a lot of uh, seat of the pants instinct about how um, climate of planets work and it's really designed to cover not just global warming, but also distant past climates and uh, climates of solar system planets, climates of uh, extrasolar planets, and uh, to provide students with the toolkit needed to write their own models. And that's, um, that book was published this year? That's right. It just came out in yes. January. And you, you wrote another book that was more of a historical look at the development of the physical ideas behind warming, right? That's right, yes. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's called The Warming Papers, uh, Co-authored with, uh, co-authored or co-edited with uh, Dave Archer, and that's a collection of um, classic papers leading up to the current concern about global warming, together with interpretive essays. Uh, yes, that must have been a fun book to write. Oh, that was terrific! And um, in speaking of you know what our life is like as climate scientists, uh, the way we wrote that book, the way Dave and I wrote that book, is we made a list of papers to read, and then we read them all in our journal club. Uh, which was a weekly meeting where we read a paper and some student discusses it. And so we really had a great time uh, uh, digging into what 
these classic papers actually said. And some of them were absolute gems, like the, yeah. the paper by uh, Boleyn and Erickson about uh, carbon uptake in the ocean is just a classic of chemical oceanography. I've hardly ever seen a nicer piece of science. And they actually made a prediction for um, what um, the range of carbon dioxide concentrations would be around the year 2000. And um, doggone it, if they weren't pretty much right. Right on. Hey, listen, um, when you, I found in my own research, when I read these historic papers, I often get deep insights about my own current research. Did that happen while you were writing this book? Oh, oh very definitely. Uh, and, but particularly with regard to the, uh, with regard to the areas that I was not um, formally actively uh, working on, uh, I, I found going right to the original source was a good, was a good way to, to really uh, uh, understand how the discovery process worked in these areas. And so I've gotten into um, uh, long-term effects of carbon dioxide uh, and things related to uh, ocean carbon uptake and the right. rate of ocean carbon uptake and, and reading that Boleyn and Erickson paper and really understanding it, re-implementing it. That was, uh, that was uh, a, a discovery. real help yeah, yeah, yeah. this area. And... Um Wow, that must have been quite a, a walk through history. What's the biggest mistake that one of these uh, great scientists from the past made, uh, and and why did he why did he or she make it? Well, I'd say the biggest blunder in the entire well, there are two blunders in the book uh, that we noticed. Uh, uh, one was at the very beginning uh, by Fourier, who was right about so many things. Fourier was the first person to really formulate the problem of planetary temperature uh, as a problem in physics. And he was spot on that it's a matter of balancing the energy absorbed from the sun versus the energy radiated away as infrared. And he even realized that the atmosphere makes the heat loss by infrared less efficient. Right. And we we, we, we only right. have a few seconds left, uh, uh, Ray, so please um, tell us about Fourier's error. Okay, so he thought that a big source, another source of heat was the temperature of space. Uh, he thought space was hot and okay. it warm the Earth. Okay, well, that's, that's a mistake that's more due to uh, a lack of empirical knowledge, isn't it? Well, actually, it, it's not using the knowledge he had because he was in drawing inferences from nighttime temperature. Uh -huh. uh, and and uh, he didn't make use of knowledge he demonstrated he had in other parts of the paper. Right, because the atmosphere itself will be causing a lot of that heat. That exactly, you're and the oceans right. too. Right. Yep. Oh, how interesting. Well, it just shows that even a great thinker, a, a, a giant, basically, Fourier, can, can make these fundamental mistakes. Right, and it also shows science is self-correcting because uh, within, say, a decade of that paper, uh, that had all been sorted out. Yeah. It's been wonderful having this in-depth conversation with you, Ray. Uh, can we do it again sometime in the future? I'd be happy to do that. Okay, thank you very much for being with us. Okay, well, it was a pleasure. All right, bye-bye now. Bye-bye now. Bye. Well, that's it for the 5 o'clock train. Stay tuned for uh, Au Coeur de la Rue, and we're just going to have a transition song. This is the... Sorry. Sorry about that. That's my technical side showing up. The Bastard Fairies, and the song is called Whatever, one of my favorites, and hope you enjoy.